a letter. I can give you this exclusively. I've just sent a letter to the Smith Commission. You know, this is the commission that's been set up by David Cameron to look into this process of what powers are handed over to the Scottish Parliament. Because, as you know, Michael, the last two years, six parties have been involved in this referendum. Three on the yes side, the SNP, the Greens and ourselves. Three on the no side, Labour, the Tories and Liberal Democrats. Five parties invited to join the commission. One, wasn't he? Any prizes for guessing what party wasn't invited to join the commission? Mm. Just Lord Smith a, 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 a letter this morning saying, David Cameron has demanded that this process should be inclusive and it should be engaging every section of Scottish society. And what have you done? You've excluded the Scottish Socialist Party, you've disengaged us and a section of society and the schemes of Scotland who poured out in their tens and hundreds of thousands to vote yes are effectively told, you can go home now. Leave it to the wigs and the gowned individuals for the House of Lords and we'll get back to you and tell you what powers we're having. Well, we're not having it. We're not going to be excluded and we're going to put in a submission whether Lord Smith likes it or not. What do you expect to come of it? Well, I'm not quite so cynical as the others. A lot of people saying nothing will come of it. Actually, I think the British ruling classes were terrified in the course of this referendum campaign. We 10 days to go. As you know, there was, a re there was an opinion poll that showed us to be in the lead and we were. And that's when Gordon Brown was resurrected and run up to lone head miners welfare to make a speech about maybe we'll come forward with extra powers and maybe we'll get them by St Andrew's night and maybe you'll know them by Burns night and maybe they'll get through before the next Westminster election rises for the general election. I think the British ruling classes are under enormous pressure to deliver and I think they will. Why do you say that? Not because I've got any faith in them. And not because I believe the powers will be anything more than piddling, but the frank fact of the matter is if they don't deliver, then the next test of public opinion and independence will see a landslide because people don't react well to treachery. And I think they know that. And I think that's part of the pressure they're under. So it's our job to ensure that the powers are all we can make them. I don't expect them, the Labour Party and the Tories and the Liberals to come forward with very much at all. But... I don't believe they're that stupid to come forward with nothing. Have you seen the stushy that's grown up today about the uh, voter registration and poll tax and yeah. Alex Salmon and Col Col I mean, are they? Yeah. you said that they're excluding the SSP from the process. Is, the, is this them trying to exclude even more people from the process next time round already? I, I think this is madness. I think Alex Salmon's very wise here and, he, and he's basically warning local authority Neanderthals to back off and don't be so stupid, right? You can't, on the one hand, celebrate 97% registration and 90%, 91% turnout in some constituencies, didn't you? Yeah. You celebrate that. You don't then turn around and say, do you know what? Seeing return for registering, return for engaging, we're going to chase you for 25-year-old debts that you didn't have then and you certainly don't have now. It's a preposterous notion, and the First Minister's absolutely right to say, do you know, these debts were written off in England and Wales 12 years ago. And what, what is it, the ultimate insult in it? In Scotland, they introduced the poll tax a year early, and here we are, 11 years after they've already written off all the debts, as bad, irrecoverable debts. And the reason they did it in England isn't it because they're particularly enlightened, it's because it's pragmatic. Why spend good money? chasing money you'll never see. Why would you spend 100 quid chasing 20 quid that you're never going to get? And it costs money to you know chase after debt. I think in the TV here last night I noticed that there's allegedly outstanding poll tax debts of, I think it's £140 million. Last year, poll tax and council tax debts recovered £400,000. In other words, it was pitiful. And in that £400,000 recovery, you'd had to pay sheriff officers, you had to go to the sheriff court, you've got a whole mu number of admin staff chasing, etc. It's a nonsense. It's bad economics. And I think the First Minister's right. Morally, it's indefensible. And economically, it's absolutely stupid. It's absolutely stupid. It's punishing the poor. Punishing the poor. And quite frankly, you know, I'd never paid my poll tax. I, I, I was never going to pay it. I, you know, from our point of view... And the, anti poll tax federation. 16 million people never paid it, remember? And the reason they never paid it was they didn't have it. They didn't have it to pay. They didn't have 1,600 quid that they could pay over in poll tax arrears. 
a poll tax debts, you know. So, you know, I, I think the councils would be mad, and my expectation is no local authority in Scotland is stupid enough to think they're going to recover debts for 25 years ago. Be people who may have died, be people who didn't have it then and certainly don't have it today. It's a nonsense story, you know, percolated by Tories who allegedly believe that we should go after people who don't pay their taxes. Well, I expect to see Alec Johnson, Tory MSP for the Highlands, on the first plate from Edinburgh to the Cayman Islands, to Liechtenstein, to Jersey, to Guernsey, chase the billions and billions of billions of pounds his type don't pay in evading their taxes. Of course, they won't do that, will they? Oh, Starbucks or Vodafone or whoever else. Exactly. Just to come back to something you said earlier, you said we were winning with a week to go. And this is maybe what kind of sticks in the craw of a lot of people. We were winning. And a lot of people think that Gordon Brown's vow or the party's vow endlessly repeated that day. But I mean, the last week on mainstream media was just an absolute onslaught of... Uh, no campaign stuff. They just, it was wall to wall and they'd stepped it up. It was worse than what we'd seen in the run up to the war on Iraq. Yeah. In terms of the few, okay, well, two questions. The first one, how bad did you feel it was? And secondly, in terms of the future, how can we get over this independence line when we know that most of the mainstream media is clearly against us? Yeah, well, there's, there's two or three questions even in your one question. The first thing is that poll was accurate. That, that's the first thing to say. That poll was accurate. And this is when the British ruling class, including people like Gordon Brown, panicked. And they made a calculation which is to say, Michael Greenwell, Colin Fox, forget them. Forget them. They're going to vote yes. There's nothing we can do about them. And the millions like them, right? Or the one and a half million like them. We're going after the ones who said that they preferred Devo Max to independence. That's, they, they seen that as the this, this, uh, soft underbelly of the Yes campaign, right? And they realised it was too late with 10 days to go to be very specific about what extra powers, but they made an attempt to go after that. Conservative, you know, elderly, well-to-do part of Scottish society and try and strip them away from the, yes, the rest of the Yes campaign. And when you look at it, Michael, see the figures that are now available. 1.6 million voted Yes. Two million voted no. The two million, who are they? Generally speaking, they're the elderly, who voted by three to one in favour of no. Rural Scotland, again, voted three to 41, no. Well-to-do conservative Scotland, middle-class Scotland, again, big proportions have voted no. The Edinburgh financial services industry, the Aberdeen oil industry, rural farmers, etc. You know, when you looked at the no side of the argument, this is who they were. And these are, generally speaking, they're conservative, they're timid, they're frightened. They were frightened by the propaganda of the No campaign. And they were frightened by the onslaught, as you put it, in the last 10 days. On the other side of the equation, you have to say 1.6 million Scots stood up defiantly in the face of absolutely everything thrown at them. A royal baby in a Monday are running the pound on the Tuesday, billions written off Scottish share companies on the Wednesday, Kim Il-sung, the North Korean leader, he was coming out for yes on the Thursday. You know, it was, as you say, it was an endless turn. 1.6 million stood up to it, defiantly, bravely. Who were they? Young, working class, courageous, progressive-minded, forward-looking. They represent the best of our country. And I, I would honestly say to you, they represent the best of every country. It's not a good place to be, always being frightened to leave your bed in the morning. Frightened of change. Frightened of this, frightened of that. Keep things as they are. And of course, the Scottish middle class are nowhere near as progressive as they like to believe they are. The middle classes who talk about, well, we really must do something about poverty, Michael. We really must redistribute the wealth. But no, my wealth... No, 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 my wealth, I'm getting the tax the accountant and to make sure I don't pay any extra taxes or I'll leave the country if you try and redistribute wealth. So I think that result in the 18th of September showed as many things about our country, about the different classes in our country, some things that are immensely honourable and noble and make you proud, and others that make you, quite frankly, sad that people are so meek and timid and so easily intimidated. 
But the tactics of the no side were to amplify Devo Max as an option instead of independence because they thought they could get that narrow band of constituency. And some sophologists, John Curtis and others, may well find that they succeeded. But what they've done is, in effect, said that, you know, these extra powers, if they're piddling, if they don't come forward, if David Cameron wins again and we're sitting this time next October with a Tory government, we know powers worth a damn haven't come forward. And that Tory government having a referendum and an in-out referendum in Europe, then my goodness me, the whole independence horizon, the battleground, if you can put it that way, that we fought on the 18th of September is totally different and far better suited towards a yes vote then. So how do you think we can get this yes vote, knowing that the media would probably do the same again? Well, I think, you know, the media were atrocious. The BBC surpassed all their expectations for bias. I mean, I was watching newscasters editorialise it well. I think the worst one i seen was Andrew Marr was in the interview, and I think it was uh, Gideon Osborne or something like that, and Andrew Marr says, and what if there is a yes vote on Thursday? I mean, God forbid, he said, there should be a yes vote, but what if there is? And you think, Andrew Marr is an interviewer. He's editorialising there. I don't give a monkey's about Andrew Marr's opinion or Jeremy Paxman or Sally Magenson or any of the BBC. Their job isn't to editorialise. Their job is to report. And the BBC blew it, I think, big style. I mean, I wrote a letter to them. They've done a documentary here, I think, Tuesday night. I don't know if you've seen it. Hour-long documentary on the referendum and independence and never acknowledged the Scottish Socialist Party's existence once. And I says, you know what? I wouldn't have expected anything less for the BBC. Their journalistic standards were appalling. Their bias was appalling. But ultimately, of course, this is the state broadcaster. The British state broadcaster was manipulated by the British state in a way that you and I probably expected. Yeah, it's, it's something that you've seen through the Iraq war, but also in the miners' strike. You know, it's the classic tactic. So what would happen was... Um, Police would charge the miners. One miner would maybe throw something back, and then what? And they've got the, the all the cameras pointed towards the miners. So right. then it's like uh, miners attack police, uh, yeah. and then you know. And I mean, it it has been that blatant in the past, and I think it was that blatant this time. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm I'm saying to you that I think the BBC standing in British society and in Scottish society has never been so low. Never in my lifetime, it's never been so low. I mean, the BBC have not only been implicated by a role they played in Iraq, which was disgraceful, they were implicated in the Levinson inquiry, the way they conducted their you know, current affairs programmes. They've been involved in the cover-up of Jimmy Savile, Rolf Harris, Dave Lee Travis, etc., etc. And now they're playing a blatant role as the state propagandists. I mean, who honestly believes that the North Korean broadcasting service is any more biased than the BBC? They're both the same. You can't expect impartial reportage for the BBC anymore. BBC, rest in peace. It's no longer a place where you expect neutral and impartial and accurate reportage and the, the, the news coverage. I, I don't expect that anymore. No, uh, but the trick is trying to get a lot of other people to see it. Given all this and some of the stuff that's come out, you know, like I said earlier, the, the human rights stuff, the powers that are disappearing, the extra oil, austerity is going to continue. The NHS is actually under threat. That's another Labour one. Save the NHS, yeah. stay with us. Oh, the NHS is going to die, vote for us. Uh, yeah. But I mean, given that all this has happened, are you finding it? And this is something I think that, yes, campaigners and whether we're calling ourselves the, the Independence Alliance or the 45 plus or whatever now, are you finding it difficult not to say I told you so to some people <laughs> at the moment? No, 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 no. I mean, I, I think you you put your finger on it. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no value in celebrating 45. We needed 50. We need 51. We need to get more. We need to get more people over to our point of view. And I think the most persuasive way of doing it is to present the case that we presented and say, this is what we want. We want a social democratic Scotland. You know, all the arguments we put in the course of the referendum. My, my feeling is. We won the argument hands down. We're proud of the arguments that we proffered. You know, we get 45% for a vision of a Scotland that's a far better place than A, we have just now, or B, that's coming down the line. And we have to continue to persuade a majority of our fellow Scots that that's a better place to live for them and their children. I mean, my dad, my dad's 78. 
spoke to my dad over the weekend and he's furious at, at older Scott 